So if you bought your Bibles tonight, I'd like you to open them up at um, 2 Peter. Now Peter, of course, do you remember what academic qualifications he had? He was a fisherman. Right, so you'd expect him to understand water. And I was asked uh, by one of the young gentlemen here this evening, how are you getting on with co recovering from all the floods that you had earlier this year? And I had to tell him, I'm going to be speaking about that tonight. And the Apostle Peter, didn't he try to walk on water once? Didn't do it very well. Um, but as a fisherman, he should have at least had some understanding of water. And God uses him to write some letters to the early Christians and from them down to us. And in verse 3, Peter writes, Know this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water, and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now did you notice that Peter mentions words like creation? He mentions words like water? He mentions words like flood. He mentions words like judgment. So I guess you can say he probably goes from Genesis to Revelation. But I'm going to pick one aspect tonight. And we are going to give you a chance to ask me some questions. And if you don't get uh, your chance or you're not brave enough, feel free to go to our new Ask website. We open that up specifically for students. And no, it's not my job to answer all your questions. But it's my job to find the people who can answer all your questions. And so this week we have a question on, is that fisher pod tiktalic proof that fishes evolved into reptiles? Because that's what the textbooks say. That's what the museums say. And last week we had one on snakes. How could a good God make venomous snakes? Um, questions from Greenland to Antarctica, basically from students all over the planet. Um, but tonight, we're going to pick one aspect of what Peter talked about. We're going to deal with, first of all, water in the present day world. <coughs> we were blessed with a lot of water earlier this year because we'd just finished 10 years of drought. Uh, you, you people don't really understand drought over here. You, you do understand that, don't you? You don't understand drought. <laughs> I, I've always smiled at the size of your big water reservoirs and I thought, that's a dam? That's a water reservoir? That's a pond. Um, you know, and when I see people saying, well, it hasn't rained for three weeks. We're in serious trouble. Hmm. First town I worked outside in the country, it hadn't rained for five years before I got there. And all the kids under five had never seen rain. And I remember one parent telling me as he was driving his first class child to school, you know, the kid was in grade one, and it began to rain again, so he switched on the windshield wipers and the kid near died of fright! <laughs> Didn't know where they'd come from, never seen them before. Well, we were blessed with lots of water this year after a decade of drought. Australia's where we're going to go and show you. You see Brisbane over here? I live in the bush outside of Brisbane. It's in the state of Queensland. Yes, a very royalist state originally, particularly in Queen Victoria's day. And we're going to go uh, outside a little town called Gympie. That's an Aboriginal word. So if you think the Welsh have got funny names for towns, you ought to come to Australia. We have even funnier ones over there. And we're going to take you to uh, our Jurassic Ark project. And if you want to follow up more, creationresearch.net. There's a button on the front page. You can follow it up because there's a museum and dig site. Actually, it's basically the world's only outdoor creation museum and fossil site. Well, here it is normally. You know, the lovely little wallabies and kangaroos. It's, it's idyllic. And uh, many years ago, some farmers found what they thought were bits of petrified wood. They called me in. We ended up doing some digging. And and they used them as evidence of millions of years of evolution. And most people in England say, if that's true, the biblical account 
is absolutely false. So that's the back of the flood. Well, you're going to see the effect of the flood short. But here's one of the bits we excavated. Can you see all the trees that have turned stone here? But what's the word starting with P that we use for trees that have turned stone? Petrified. And a good reminder that Jesus understood language. Remember when he said to Peter, you are the rock? These trees are Peterified. It's the same word. Interesting how language goes, isn't it? Well, there's some trees. You'll notice they've got no branches and no roots. They're logs. They've turned to stone. That's a fossil flood log jam for one simple reason. There's a present day log jam. But those trees haven't turned to stone. And we take people, we take visitors, we sort of sort of way. They think actually rather than sitting in a classroom all day, this is just a good way to relieve your frustration. But come January, the storming began. And uh, one night on a nearby mountain, there was 16 inches of rain in four hours or 400 mils, depending on what system you're in. So as the water poured down, well, you can see the river here. As you're crossing the bridge, the water is coming up to meet you. Oh, but no, you're quite right. It's not raining there. The rain was somewhere else. And just as well, you made it across because you didn't have a chance to go back. And at our site, well, the prevention barriers began to fail as an incredible amount of water poured onto the site until ultimately 95% of our dig site was under water. Now, we use the word flood for that, correct? And isn't there a flood in your Bible that Peter was referring to in 2 Peter chapter 3? And most people, if I talk about floods in the Bible, they can think of one in particular. Uh, Noah's flood, correct? Hmm. You go to the news agent, you pick up a book on Noah, and he's a little guy with a white coat on and sandals, and there's a funny looking boat with a giraffe out the chimney. The kids in this country grow up thinking it's a fairy story. And Peter said, just as it was. You know, when the world was made in water and bought out of water and then destroyed by water? Interesting. There's no doubt about it, we suffered a lot of damage at our Jurassic Ark site in the floods. After the water went down, the young man we employ there, Carl, where are the fossil trees gone? I mean, are they underneath the mud? Are they 100 kilometres downstream? Where are they? Only one of them really survived unscathed because it was above water level. But if you're wondering why God used water to destroy the world in Noah's day, let's look at what water actually does. There's a spillway during the flooding. The water is moving from right to left. Look what it starts to do. Not weeks later, this is the same day. Do you notice the big hole that's being dug out here? Now most people think water pushes. But water only pushes things that are floating on it. Um, how does water erode things? Do you remember Grandma when she bought little Johnny that bow and arrow set? But it was a safe bow and arrow set, health and safety regulations, etc. It now has a rubber suction cap on the front. And he licks it and then he shoots it at the wall, just where Mum said he wasn't allowed to. Right? And then when he pulls it off, he discovers why Mum said he wasn't allowed to. Because the paint came off, the plaster came off, all because of the strength of the water molecules as they basically uh, cling on to the, the stuff that's underneath it. Water doesn't push, water sucks. Look at the result. A mini Grand Canyon. All of that stuff was sucked out and pushed away to the system there. Okay, um, the wheelchair path. You see it's been torn to shreds. Okay, we, we had a problem. We spent a lot of money on this. Water. Water came up. Springs punched through the ground. The front entry track was demolished. We spent a small fortune doing this. Now we had to say, oh, I've got to raise money again. I've got to go and fix it up. Look what the newspapers called it. A biblical catastrophe. Interesting. Uh, which biblical catastrophe do you think they were referring to? Come on, was it the apocalypse? The burning of the world? 
That was Noah's flood beyond a shadow of a doubt. In fact, look at the green website. They said biblical Australian floods. These are people who are total evolutionists. Um, biblical Australian floods covering an area the size of France and Germany combined. Now that's a flood, by the way. I, I don't know if you've got any idea how big that is, but the state of Queensland is seven times the size of the entire United Kingdom. And at one stage we had water for 3,000 miles. That is a lot of water. But uh, they called it biblical. And the only flood you can even comp compare it with in Genesis is this one. But when you start comparing it, you discover their version of biblical and what Genesis says are two different things. The flood in Noah's day is described and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Do you realise that if you want to sit down with a map and try and figure out how you could cover all the high hills under the whole heavens without covering planet earth, you can't do it. The biblical flood covered planet earth. Our flood? Well, it covered an area the size of France and Germany combined. Don't get me wrong, that's impressive. But it's not a biblical flood. Um, you can learn some things about big floods from little floods. So let me take you. Um, there's the aerial picture here. You see the river? That's before the flood. Here it is after the flood. 20 acres roughly, 8 hectares, 12 feet deep, shifted. No, not in weeks. This was water that tore down here and in a couple of days that's all happened. If you uh, were the farmer looking at your new cliff, how would you have felt? I mean, that land there, if you got in a company with trucks and asked them to shift that much soil and then you had to pay all the fuel costs, this is a big job. That's an awful lot of power is involved in water. And when I go to universities, and if you look at the uh, schedule, you'll see I've got a uh, session at Southampton, and on Tuesday the 11th of October I'm debating one of their atheist physicists. Now, he will not like a concept of a worldwide global judgment by water. So I'll probably have my job cut out for me. But when I'm on university campuses, I'm amazed that people will ask me things about Noah's flood, including things like, well, look, the story couldn't possibly be true. Because if Noah had a hundred years to build the ark, then all the people must have at least watched a little bit of what he did. So when it started to rain, surely they would have built their own boats and all been saved. Well, such people don't understand floods, even in the present day world. Let me show you. You see, we've got a time chart at the bottom end there. You see the water is coming down. Now here we are 11 minutes later. Now notice it's not raining. In fact, here we are seven minutes after that. In fact, here we are four minutes later. How's your boat building going? You see, Noah's flood is interesting because Noah's flood is not just rain. Noah's flood is where the fountains of the deep broke open as well. And the purpose of Noah's flood was not only to destroy the earth, but to kill all life that had breath that was not on Noah's ark. Now that's a biblical flood. Um, here's a creek. I take students here and uh, every year we go and dig up fossils across Murphy's Creek. You can see it's only a tiddly little creek here, a yard or two, a metre or so wide. Now this is where they had one of those inland tsunamis. Did you get that term over here where a huge amount of water just tore down the valley? So there we are before the surge. Here we are afterwards. Now if that doesn't impress you, let's put a truck in the bottom. Now if you own an excavation company, um, wouldn't you like to be able to shift that much soil in 30 minutes? You realise even today, floods that are not global are still impressive. That does raise a good point, by the way, that if that canyon took 30 minutes, how long did this canyon take? Because you see, the average person going to the Grand Canyon is told that a little river took millions of years. 
and they think in terms of vast amounts of time. But did you notice something? It wasn't the 30 minutes that eroded that canyon. It was the power of the water. And the time doesn't erode anything. I say that because most people live on a planet where they, given long enough, molecules will make life. Given long enough, water will erode canyons. Wrong. Given the right process, you can erode that canyon. Given the wrong process, it will never happen at all. The issue is not time, but process. Uh, and the floods in Australia finished this way. Uh, you've probably got the same name. I mean, we took this picture from our gimpy site. You, you, you can see this thing here. What do you call that seven coloured thing? Don't you call it a rainbow? Okay, now why would the people like the Courier Mail and the Greens use the concept biblical catastrophe? I'll tell you why. Because that's the way the Archbishop thinks. That's the way most Bible college leaders think. A little flood up the back of the creek at Sumer. They don't see it as a worldwide global flood at all. But this gives it away. You see, when you read your Bible, you discover that God ties that sign into a promise. And he says, when you see the rainbow, you will know that I will never again send a flood to destroy the whole earth. Interesting. God has kept his promise. Biblical catastrophe? No. Impressive, but not biblical. All right, that's one of the jobs that God has given me to do, to remind people there are plenty of opinions and theories about the flood, about creation, about the origin of life, the age of the earth, the length of the days in Genesis. There are plenty of theories and opinions that disagree with the Bible, but the facts never do. I mean, there's not a single fact came out of that catastrophic deluge we had in Queensland that contradicts anything in the biblical account at all, including the rainbow at the end. Or if you have a God who said, I'm going to show you a rainbow, I'll never send such a flood again. If your God sent such a flood, a little back up of the creek in Brisbane, then your God's a liar. You don't have any other options. And sadly, the God who the liberals are portraying from their pulpits actually is a God who tells lies. Because he sent plenty of little floods. And he never promised to not send little floods. He only promised to not send one that destroyed the whole planet. And when it comes to rain, well, isn't climate change still an issue? I mean, did you read the uh, science, New Scientist report this morning? Well, perhaps you didn't. But they're having a shot at the New Times World Atlas. Because the Times World Atlas has actually got Greenland all wrong. For the simple reason they mapped Greenland according to their theories of climate change. And the man who runs the satellites that takes the picture said, here's the satellite picture. It's not like that. They said 15% of the ice is melted and that simply, click, is provably false. So even the Times magazine has an attitude about rain and ice and everything. And the interesting thing is, so does the Bible. Now, when we come back, we're going to be looking at the evidence in the Jurassic Ark site for creation, for the flood, etc. And Jesus said, love your enemies that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, we're going to have a question time later, and if you've still got questions about climate change or global warming or anything, you'll get an opportunity. They're all actually related to the things that Peter said about the water in the beginning, the creation, Noah's flood, and the coming. Idea, um, is very angry at me. He's one of Australia's leading atheists, and he's determined to get rid of Christians and Christianity out of education totally. Now, what's he doing on the front page there? Well, we're in the National Australian newspaper, and on page two, they report about me. I was caught in a government high school teaching a lesson on creation. Now, we do this over here too, but I don't normally tell our supporters at all because it creates such furor. You may have read The Guardian yesterday or The Times. David Attenborough, Richard Dawkins are attacking creationists and they want legislation blocking us out of schools. 
So the newspaper reported the furor over government funded school chaplains is intensifying after a Queensland chaplain arranged for creationist John Mackay to deliver a scientific lecture to students. Well, totally accurate. It's exactly what I did. Mr Mackay, whose website blames Darwinism for last month's massacre. Do we really? Well, you can go to our website and discover that it's not us who's doing the blaming, but the man who blew up those buildings and shot a low students actually admits himself he's a Darwinist and he's just practising survival of the fittest. Because Darwin himself said, Europeans are better than Turks, we've been beating them up for ages, we'll continue to beat them up. And that was this guy's attitude. And of course they are claiming that uh, this guy's a fanatic who is speaking religious propaganda disguised as science. So what they're trying to do, of course, is to get almost a lawsuit against us so we can get kicked out of all schools. Interesting. I was doing this in the Gympie High School because we just finally finished our Jurassic Ark site repairs. Now, we could go on and talk about that, but you can get the full story there and see the ABC television clips um, talking all about how bad creationists are. But I do have to smile because the God of the Bible promises that he will turn things around um, whenever he has a purpose to achieve. So what's been interesting is the guy who organised my access to the school says their whole schedule has backfired. The whole thing has opened up opportunities for me to share the gospel in ways I've not had during the past 18 months. Conversations with staff, students and wider community who read all about what happened. Wow, that's fantastic. You see, many of the staff didn't even know this guy existed in the classroom. Now the press has given us free publicity, attacked creationists, opposed anybody who runs an outdoor Noah's flood site in Gympie. Um, he says God has used it to give me more opportunities. All right, in this country, we shouldn't be surprised that Dawkins and Attenborough, who are both atheists, are attacking Christianity because Jesus said that in Luke 16. If people do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, <clears throat> though one rose from the dead. Interesting challenge from Jesus Christ. What you go on to see is do the flip side. If they do hear, listen, accept, believe Moses and the prophets, they can be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You do realize that's the flip side of that? If they don't listen to Moses, they won't listen to me. If they do listen to Moses, accept, believe, then you can persuade them. Do you know why the media was so upset that in opening our Gympie Noah's Flood Creation Museum, we were in the schoolrooms? They, they've scoured our website looking for weaknesses in the creation course. We've got a whole high school creation course there, but they haven't been able to find a criticism at all. Their problem is not the scientific evidence, their problem is as soon as you finish talking about creation, guess what questions the students put their hand up and ask? Well, where did God come from? They start asking you straight away about Noah's flood. Well, if there is a God, da 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 da. That's what the atheists are upset about. Because what Jesus said is true. If you can get past Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, then you watch what happens next. It's amazing. In this country, this young man here, he came to one of my seminars quite a few years ago and uh, it was an all day seminar and I'd be honest, it was one of the longest seminars I've ever run in this country and I was exhausted by the end of the afternoon. I didn't know he'd come as an atheist because by the end of the afternoon he'd lost his confidence in evolution. It wasn't long after before he gets saved and then we met up with him in 2007 and he told us in 2008 he was going to go into full-time Christian ministry. And then we met him. Uh, you see, he now works full-time and heads up outreach to Asians. I oh, don't be surprised. He's well suited to outreach to Asians, don't you think? Um, that's his cultural background. Okay, so he's gone from being a Richard Dawkins evolutionist, anti-Noah's flood. Now he's a Christian. And is wonderful evidence that what Jesus said is true. If you do believe what Moses said, then you can accept what Jesus has said. It's interesting when you uh, have a think about how the devil sometimes overshoots his whole argument. In Australia, 
we have a government led by an atheist. She's in lots of trouble with much of the population at the moment because she refuses to apologise for saying before the election she would never, repeat, never implement a carbon tax and as soon as she gets elected, she implements a carbon tax. But then if you're an atheist, what is truth? But as a result, many of the government departments have had to implement new policies. Now, you know that scripture where God says he'll even take the wealth of the pagans and hand it over to the people of God? It's interesting how God does that. Because as a result of her policies, we got a phone call from a big nursery. And the nursery said, we have lots of trees here that the government is no longer buying. Um, the policy is now to only plant drought resistant, water tolerant or drought tolerant plants. Uh, we have lots of cycad trees here, so if you want to come and get them, they're yours. By the way, these were not little seedlings. These were ones where you needed tractors to dig the holes and trucks to actually bring them. These were mature adult cycads. Now, I know you're not too familiar with cycads over here, but I'm sure you can appreciate that if you want to buy a two to three metre adult tree by the truckload, have you looked at the prices lately? Tens of thousands of dollars was given to our Outdoor Creation Museum simply because of a stupid government policy. So I'm praising God for their attitudes on global warming because it's actually been a benefit to everything we stand for. Because you see, I have a very distinct attitude which is based on accepting what Jesus said about water. Now that's where we started, wasn't it? Peter said, the world was created covered with water. That world was lifted out of the water. That world was destroyed by water. Hmm. And Jesus said, that you may be sons of your fathers in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You want to love your enemies? My father does. He sends his rain on the ones he doesn't love and the ones he does love. He sends his rain on his enemies. And he sends his rain on his friends. Um, by the way, that's a whole climate change policy there. It tells you that the government, the United Nations, the EC is not in charge, or the EU rather, is not in charge of the water. Don't be surprised that God can do this because back in Genesis chapter 1, do you realise you read about the creation of water? That's what you do. God himself created water. But he didn't make it rain for quite a long time after that. And the first reference to rain is right at the start of Noah's flood in Genesis chapter 7. Okay, so what did we have to do to get this outdoor museum up and going and what do people see there? We obviously had big holes to fill in. And I've always wanted to play with big toys. Big boys, big toys, etc. Fill, fill, dig, dig. Find the logs again, dig them out. Some of the parts of the uh, park loved the rain. In fact, our Garden of Eden has really thrived. Magnificent. But part of the project is to deal with those cycads that you saw, because do you see the word we use? He didn't invent the word living fossil, Charles Darwin did. You've heard of him? He's Richard Dawkins' saint. Richard Dawkins has all his hope in Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution. And he invented the phrase living fossil because he found lots of creatures that look the same in the rocks as they do in the present, including cycads. By the way, don't they look beautifully green after all the rain that we've had? Magnificent. So what we've done is we've found the fossils in the rocks and we've planted the same plants alongside of them so students can see how much things have changed. Remember when David Attenborough planted one of those in Kew Gardens? You can probably still bring it up on the BBC. He said, isn't evolution marvellous? This wool of my pine has remained unchanged for 200 million years. What? David Attenborough just went, boom, shot himself in the foot. Because you see, if you've got living ones and they look the same, we've made our business to collect these from around the planet. If the living ones look the same as the fossil ones, then the one thing you haven't helped is the theory of evolution. 
Do you realise one of the reasons we've set up this outdoor museum is that Christianity is the only faith on the planet where the facts matter? If you're a Buddhist, it doesn't matter what you believe, really. In fact, have you ever been to a Quranic session and attempted to ask a question of the Imam? You don't ask questions, you listen. You don't challenge the Quran in any way, shape or form. Interesting. There's a fossil tree fern that I found out of our strata uh, near our Jurassic Ark site. How do we know it's a tree fern? I grow them down my backyard. And Genesis 1 says 10 times that God created things after their own kind. And it shouldn't surprise you as you read through your Bible that it's the one so-called religious book on the planet where the Apostle Paul writes to people and says, prove all things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Test everything and only keep the things that are true. If it is true that God created tree ferns after their own kind, then it shouldn't surprise you that no matter how long you think tree ferns have been on the planet, you can prove tree ferns have always turned into tree ferns. Now, we don't have too many fossil orchids, but we do have some fossil orchids. I like the living ones better myself. Aren't they pretty? See how we grow them in Australia? I nailed that one onto that log. They just do that out there. Sorry about your country where you have to have expensive greenhouses and things like that. But uh, guess how you recognise a fossil orchid? Looks like an orchid. Every fossil orchid I've seen just looks like an orchid. They're easy to recognise, really. Or you may not know their scientific or technical name. Meet Gary. You can pray for him. You can pray for Carl. Here's one of our fossil trees we're having to put back together. Interesting. In fact, for the first time in my life, I became a tree hugger. Uh, there's the young man we employed as caretaker up there. And uh, we were practising putting this tree together so that we could re-erect it in the, on the edge of our living fossil garden. Here's the fossil one. Hmm, look at the living ones. Oh, we know exactly what this is because we've had specimens of these to the forestry department. We were pretty sure we knew exactly what they were, but we wanted them to confirm it. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, they are living uh, fossil oricaria trees like our southern conifers, our woolamai pines, our, our um, uh, uh, bunya pines, etc. Living ones, fossil ones, provably. And on the opening day, well, one of the persons who uh, has been a great blessing to us over the years is Dr. Diane Eager, who was a lecturer in medical biology at the uh, University of Canberra. And you see the garden she's standing in? Yes, we planted all that. That is our Genesis garden. And she takes a delight, particularly in roses. And that's not just the Genesis garden. This is the Genesis 3 garden. What connection have roses got to Genesis 3? Isn't Genesis 3 about where thorns come from? Ah, interesting. And of course, to help people, we've actually set up lots and lots of murals, uh, courtesy of our artist Steve Cardno. And you wonder why are we painting a history from Adam to Australia? The reason is simple. Do you realise how many young people don't read anymore? Don't read at all. I mean, have a look at the new books coming out in the bookshops. They are thicker, they're expensive, and they have big print. Do you know what that tells you? The old people read, not the young people. Hmm, interesting world you live in. And so we have murals all the way from the creation of the world, all the way to Noah's flood, to Babel, and beyond. Of course, my job as the geologist there, you see these logs? They're some of the ones that we had to re-excavate after the floods. Do you notice there's no branches and no roots? Every geologist who's been there says, for sure, this is a flood deposit. These trees live somewhere else. They've been picked up. They've been torn apart, carried along, dumped and buried and petrified. And petrified, turned to stone. When you cut them and polish them, boy, do they come up beautifully. And on the day, folks love to see our Jurassic dinosaur footprints. And in Dr. Diane Eager's section, guess what fossil we held up? Our fossil thorns. Now feel free, go to the Natural History Museum and see if they have any of these on display. It's amazing what you don't see in the official museums. Um, these thorns here, I mean, they are thorns, uh, 
Well, you can call them spines or prickles. It doesn't matter that there's technical divisions in all these names, but when you fall on any of them, you really get the point. You realise your Bible is about where thorns came from? And they're the result of degeneration. We have a whole Genesis 3 garden that Diane deals with. I mean, look, we have soft, lovely bromeliads. These are members of the pineapple family. And as you go along the garden, do you see how the edge is now getting crinkled and hard? Here's a bigger one. Take you a bit closer. Do you see what's happening as the edge dries out? You're getting thorns. These are not nice. In fact, if you want to grow pineapples, one of the problems you face, well, some of them look pretty, but get you up close. You need thick leather gloves or you tear your hand to pieces. Now, when God made the world, it was very good. Good does not include having your hands torn to pieces. You can actually get infections from these plants because these things stick in you. And good does not include getting infections. And good didn't include weeds. I look after this section of the garden for one simple reason. It means I don't have to do anything. Have you noticed that? I mean, if you're a farmer, you pay DuPont £10,000 every year for weed killer. How much do you pay for the weeds? You don't. A friend of mine was witnessing to a neighbour and uh, they were just standing on the driveway and he couldn't think of how should he start to get this conversation going and then he saw one weed growing in a crack in the concrete driveway. Marvellous opportunity to witness because when God made the world, good did not include weeds. And you say, why go to so much trouble to set up a visual display from Adam to Australia? Well, IQ test time. Which ones are dead? Is it the deer? Is it Des? Or is it Dave? The reason I ask you this is you see, Dave we've known for quite a while. The deer are obviously dead. They've been shot. Dave is a deer hunter. He's helped our ministry quite a bit over the years because, you know, deer sausages, a bit of venison every now and then never goes astray. Um, but Dave rang me up in August and said, I've got a friend I'm witnessing to, Des. And he's got a few problems um, when I talk to him about Jesus. But guess where De De Dez's problems were? They weren't in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. They were in Genesis about creation. And he said, can I bring Des to talk to you? I said, sure, not a problem. So Des came. He went through the whole day up there. We walked them all through the gardens, gave them lectures on creation, on sin, on the fall, on the flood, um, right down to the present day including how much it cost us to put the museum back together again from the recent floods. I was really thrilled because I got over here at the end of the August and uh, I just got an email from Des on the 30th of August telling me that Des had got saved last night. And again, it's an illustration of the importance of this, where Jesus said, if people do not hear Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, they one rose from the dead. But the flip side is ever so important. If they do, listen, accept or believe Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, creation, the fall, Noah's flood, the judgment of Babel, the law of God, then they can be persuaded. Of course, it's not just your efforts. You've got to remember the Holy Spirit is the one who's working on them. Your job is to make sure you tell them the whole gospel from Genesis onwards. All right, there's a bit of background. Let's uh, go back to Peter. There's Peter's warning. We started there, didn't we? Know this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. Question. Willfully forget what? Now I gave a lecture at, uh, at um, sorry, a, yeah, a, a forum for the Oxford Geological Association and I was really, I guess you could say, disappointed with one of the lecturers. Sat up the back, was my biggest opponent during the night, was a lecturer in geology and I spoke on the evidence of Noah's flood. And I used all the geological evidence, I got all the myths and legends around the world from races about the evidence of Noah's flood. and. Uh, he opposed every bit of it. And then after the evening was done, he came to me and said, would I like to have a, uh, 
you know, drink in the bar. So we went into the bar and he said, you're a very brave person. I said, why? He said, because I've come across all those stories about a worldwide flood too. And I thought, well, why didn't you say so in the lecture? For this, they willfully forget. When you talk to Richard Dawkins, he knows Christianity, but he chooses to willfully ignore it and deny it. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens are of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Question, where did Peter get this idea from? Answer, Genesis chapter 1. Verses 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Do you know those verses? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the... Okay, so the world was formed covered with water. And in Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, And God said, Let all the water be gathered into one, one place, and let the dry land appear. There's no doubt about it, Peter is getting that picture of a world created covered by water and a world destroyed by water out of Genesis chapter 1. No doubt Peter starts. This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you might be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the holy prophets. Now that's an interesting start to that chapter. In fact, uh, did you catch Peter's drift? that you might be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets? Question, which prophets do you know of spoke about Noah's flood? And don't say Enoch, because he didn't. Interesting, isn't it? Which holy prophets? I mean, don't we normally think of prophets as someone who prophesies? It's actually got a wider meaning than that. It's anybody who teaches, really. But look, if you want to know who he's talking about here, then uh, look at the next statement. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Peter says they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens are old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. Which prophets spoke about that? You remember when uh, Moses said to the people of Israel um, in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, I want you to look for a prophet just like me. That's the person you need to be looking for, from amongst your own brothers. Now you live in a land where there's lots of Muslims coming into at the moment and they claim that they worship the, or sorry, follow the <coughs> prophet. Where do you think they get that term from? Deuteronomy chapter 18. They claim Muhammad is the prophet who fulfilled Moses' prophecy. The funny thing, it's easy to figure out that Moses was not referring to Muhammad at all because he said, look for a prophet from amongst your brothers. And if you're with President Obama at the next peace conference in the Middle East, just regard the uh, attitude of the Jews to the Arabs and how brotherly they treat each other. In fact, ask a Jew, does he consider the Arabs to be his brothers? And the answer is not one, one bit. In fact, you'll also discover that Moses was brought up in Egypt and Muhammad never went there. Who was the prophet that Moses was speaking about? Jesus. What country was Jesus brought up in? He was brought up back in Egypt, beyond a shadow of a doubt. So Moses is referring to Jesus Christ and Moses is therefore saying, look for a prophet just like me. And if Jesus was a prophet, Moses had to be a prophet. All right. They willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens are old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. And which book in the Bible do you read about those things from? Again, Genesis. Whose name is associated with Genesis? Answer, Moses. So Moses is the prophet being referred to in Peter beyond a shadow of a doubt. The one who God uses to record the whole account of Noah's flood. Notice how Peter finishes. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now, when I talk to Richard Dawkins, I actually don't regard him as a godly man. I do regard him as a scoffer, because if you watch the bit on YouTube, he's not there to critique John Mackay. 
He's there to poke fun at John Mackay. He's not there to critique creationism. He's there to ask, how dare you have a tax fund over here? What right have you got to do that? So Richard Dawkins is not just a uh, godless person. He's a godless person who is a scoffer, someone who mocks, someone who attacks you. He's actually the subject of everything 2 Peter chapter 3 is about. And Peter says, listen, they may forget the original judgment, but they won't get out of the last judgment. And it brings it up to you as well. You Christians who are here tonight, since all these things will be dissolved, writes Peter, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Question, are you looking for that world? Or have you uh, got all your riches stored up on this planet? Because this planet's going to burn up. I remember a friend of mine who was very blunt. He stayed with a very wealthy person and he uh, did have the job of reminding them why well, you got all your money tied up in bricks and mortar? God's going to burn the whole lot up. Ooh, we don't like that reminder, do we? But it's true. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? When I look at the climate change issue, God bless the people who want to improve the environment. I've done enough of it myself. I've planted hundreds of trees and all that sort of thing. But my perspective is very simple. On Judgment Day, it won't do me one bit of good. Practical. It's practical now because it's sure nice to look at, certainly helps with the air, but internally it's a waste of time. You have to keep it in perspective. God's going to burn it all up. Therefore, make sure you get your priorities, you Christians. He's, he's, he's dealt with the non-Christians now. Their judgment on judgment day will be done and a horrible shock as they end up in hell. Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough. Do you realise that's how blunt the biblical gospel actually is? They are going to end up in hell. They won't be able to get out. They'll complain all they wish. <laughs> won't do them one bit of good. But you Christians, do you realise you're going to be judged as well? Not for sin. Your judgment for sin was already taken. But you'll be judged for what you actually did for Jesus Christ. The works that you did. And uh, while you're here, can I encourage you? Are you looking for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells? My uh, wife, who's back at home in Australia, her mum and dad are both 94 this year. And uh, dad, you've got to be honest, his brain is starting to go a little bit. His body is failing him. He's one of these guys who was enthusiastic for the gospel all his days. And I remember having a conversation with him when he was 86. And he said to me, son, I've got to give up the youth group. I said, what, Dad? What? Whatever for? And he said, I just can't take McDonald's food any longer. <laughs> hmm. I said, OK, Dad. And of course, he's looking forward to meeting Jesus. Uh, but his mind's starting to go. So they sent a nurse to evaluate him for entry into a dementia ward. And uh, she asked, you know how they asked them lots of questions. Who are you? Who's the prime minister? Do you know where you are? What year it is? All those sort of things. And uh, I don't know what his score was and all of those. And then they got to one question. Are you depressed? And he said, oh, I don't even know what that means. And well, well, are you unhappy? Of course not. Jesus is my saviour. And I thought, Dad, we provided you remember that. You've got it in one. Because all the rest, it's gone. His body's failing him. Everything he's earned on this planet will be given to somebody else and burned up on Judgment Day. If you're a Christian, can I encourage you to pray for your workers here as they reach out. Pray for people like Andrew and I as we reach out in schools and colleges. Pray for that debate at the university. They will not be sitting there as mildly as you are. I'll guarantee that now in uh, the time we're down in Southampton. OK, well, did you catch we called it Jurassic Ark? OK, Jurassic, when I say that word, most people think of millions of years, a movie and dinosaurs. Right? Jurassic, uh, Jurassic Park, the movie by Steven Spielberg. If you look up your textbooks, it'll use words like 150 million years. 
What most people don't appreciate is that most of these geological names were invented, number one, by creationists. Number two, they were widely used even before Charles Darwin came on the scene. And the man who gave us the word Jurassic in 1780, uh, or 81 really, I think it was, he was Alexander von Humboldt, the famous geographer, believed in six days of creation and Noah's flood. And uh, he simply meant by that when he went to the other side of the planet, saw rocks over there that were like the ones in the Jura Mountains, right? He used the word Jurassic, or that's what it's come down to us as. All that means is like the rocks in the Jura Mountains. You want to know where the Jura Mountains are? Just go south from um, the middle of Germany down to Eichstadt, turn left. Um, the Jura Mountain Range is all across the bottom of Germany into Switzerland, France, etc. So that when I say Jurassic, it simply means like the rocks in the Jura. So when you go to the Jura Mountains, you'll see the same fossils as we've got. So there's your second definition. Wherever I find the same fossils, I give the rocks the same name. It's only after the days of Charles Lale and Charles Darwin, they start getting the millions of years added to them. How old do I believe them? Well, what we do is show people, hey, this is not just a little flood deposit here. This flood deposit at Gympie connects to the flood deposit down at Brisbane, connects to the flood deposit, and we took them, and you can see it on our website, the bus trip, we took a whole group all over that flood deposit. We travelled for 5,000 kilometres. Right? So if you think carefully, that's a lot of fossil trees, a huge forest, and that's just the bit we could take them to. So no, I don't think those rocks are 150 million years old. I think they date from the time of the flood downwards. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so the flood is only four to 5,000 years ago, not, not, not 150 million. I use the words because the words originally had no context of millions of years and nothing to do with evolution. So you come to this country and you find words like Cambrian, uh, and Cambrian refers to the rocks on the border of England and Wales. And we use that word because the Romans couldn't say C-Y-M-R-U like the Welsh said it. Um, so that's where we get words like that. So these are just location names. When you look at Devonian rocks, you studied them first in the county of Devon. And that's all it means. Well, the same thing. Okay, no, the Ice Age and the Flood are not the same thing because ice floats on water. Uh, so there's the first point. Number two, we are still in the Ice Age and we're not in the Flood. So if you come with me to Alaska, I'll show you it. Um, I've fallen through it. It's cold, right? Uh, you will find that the ice in the north is currently melting, but it's melted before and it's expanded before. Uh, the temperatures have gone up and down. So in the 1600s, uh, 1603, the Baltic Sea froze for the first time in recorded history. Now it's all gone. So the ice has expanded, the ice has gone back. Um, the ice is a post-flood phenomena, fairly easy to prove. It's, um, there are animals under it in many places. Uh, so the animals had time to get from Noah to wherever they were. And then all of a sudden, the, the climate changes really radically. Uh, if you go to Alaska, you'll find in the slush underneath the ice, there are frozen elephants. Most people are familiar with those. But you also find frozen camels, frozen lions, frozen buffaloes. Um, you find a heap of animals that you never hear about, none of which are animals from cold climates. So therefore, the ice is, is an, a, a real climate change uh, from a moderately warm environment to a suddenly very cold one, and man was not there. Right? We don't find any human fossils associated with that, except guys that fell down cracks, like the ice man in Italy. Um, and uh, so that's, that's basically Noah's flood. And then sometime after Noah's flood, you have the coming of the ice. If you want to read it scripturally, there is no ice referred to in Noah. Right? No ice, uh, no winter referred to till after Noah's flood, Genesis 8.22. And no ice referred to until roughly... Uh, the days of Job who lived shortly after the Tower of Babel. So there you have a perfect world, Adam and Eve, no clothes, beautiful climate, Noah's flood, it starts to rain, the British have to invent a brolly. Um, at the end of the flood, winter and summer, by the days of Job, ice, snow and hail. So the ice is somewhere in there. 
and at the moment, as I said, it's melting in the northern hemisphere, but don't be too worried by that. 95% of all the ice is in the southern hemisphere, a little ignored fact uh, in all the climate change. Well, basically studies. it's a heart attitude. Uh, it's hard to actually believe that people could um, set out to make this up. And they're the only words I use because the more I've studied, the more obvious it is that this is not a scientific deduction, but an actual presupposition designed to leave God out. A bit of history, you will find that um, a Frenchman by the name of Louis Leclerc de Buffon, uh, or Georges Leclerc de Buffon, uh, actually round about the time of the French Revolution, uh, you realise the French are getting rid of God, and uh, he comes up with the theory that says, well, Adam and Eve were roughly six to 8,000 years ago. That's just simply giving you a literal type chronology from Adam onwards. But the earth was here for 70,000 years before that. Where did he get that from? Well, he had a theory that says the earth formed from a hot molten block. No, he didn't get it from Genesis. Genesis says it was covered with water. So what he did was he took a molten, he took an iron ball and he heated it up until it was on the edge of melting. And then he timed how long it took to cool down to ordinary temperature. And then he said, if the ball is this big and it took three weeks to cool down, then if the ball is that big, it must have taken 70,000 years to cool down. Right? And so there's the first entry into vast ages in modern times. Um, what you'll find then is that the French, of course, if the French said it, you've got to realise the English would reject it, uh, which they did. But if the English reject it, the Scots would be all for it. So the Edinburgh University took up where Leclerc left off, right? And so Edinburgh University gets several professors who begin to push the age of the earth. And the more they push the age of the earth, the more their theologians invent things like the gap theory. So the gap theory comes from Edinburgh University. Uh, the age of the earth comes from Edinburgh University. and. Charles Lyell was born just outside of Edinburgh and Charles Darwin went to study at Edinburgh University. Right? It's amazing how these centres of influence grow up. Um, then you find Charles Lyell takes um, de Buffon's work and runs with it. De Buffon's basic theory is whatever I see a ball of iron doing, it's always done. So um, Charles Lyell says whatever we see now has always happened. But he then applies it once he becomes a convinced Darwinist. He's over on the border of England and Wales in the area where the old Ordovici people used to live and he's trying to figure out how old the rocks are. So he asked Darwin, how long does it take for one species of snail to evolve into another? And their answer is 20 million years. Now question, how did they know that? Answer, they didn't, they made it up, just made it up. And therefore, if you find 12 species of snails from the bottom rocks to the top, that means the rocks in Wales are 240 million years. And people think this is science? No, it's fairy tale, right? But it's become accepted as the only way to evaluate things. And from then on, the world has gotten older and older and older. And the real aim, and I've got it on our website, if you go to uh, creationresearch.net and go to search and then evidence search and insert L-Y-E-L-L, -L, his aim was, quote unquote, to free science from Moses. That's really, what, that's really what the fight is all about. When I have this debate at Southampton University, sooner or later I have to get it to that point. Mr. Atheist, you're not interested in the facts. Your aim is to get rid of God. When I debated um, uh, Steve Jones, University College of London, he was ranting on the BBC, you know, and his cultured tones, etc., on the evidence for evolution. And I just had to say, stop, Steve, because being blunt Australian, you can get away with it. But I said, stop, Steve, why don't you just admit now you're an atheist? And this debate has nothing to do with the facts at all. You're just prove, you know, trying to bolster up your own religion. And the poor guy went, bah, 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 bah. you know, he wasn't used to that sort of attack. But that's where it had to get to. And that's the real bottom line. People who want to leave God out, they have to put the, the beginning way, way, way back, because then you don't have to think about it. OK, well, the New Testament itself really only spans from the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, which let's say is 0 AD. It's not technically, but we'll put that there, up until around about 100 AD with the death of the Apostle John. 
Uh, so there's the time span of your New Testament, but from the birth of Jesus Christ up to the present is roughly 2,000 years and a little bit. And you're quite right, starting from Genesis 5, which is this is the book of Adam and his family tree up to the end of the Old Testament is roughly four or so thousand years, plus or minus a little bit. So yes, so you'll end up, if you look up, say, um, uh, Luther and what he thought on the age of the earth, his answer was roughly 6,000 years. Look up Calvin, the same, add it up yourself, you'll get from Adam up to the present is roughly 6,000 years. It is the, yes. Are the days of creation 6,000 yeah. years? Okay. Um, if you look carefully at the way um, Peter is arguing there, because you're quoting from 2 Peter chapter 3, and Peter is quoting from Psalm 90, verse 4, uh, what you'll find is Peter says to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The context, judgment, oh sorry, creation, judgment in Noah's flood, coming judgment, and God's mercy. All right? Uh, but God's going to run out of mercy one day because to the Lord a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Um, I'm always grateful I did a logic course once, and one of the things I learned is when you get a mysterious statement in English uh, or in any language and you can't figure out what it means, put other words in that you do understand and then you'll work backwards from there and find out what it says. So if you substitute um, names like to Tom instead of to God, Tom's a little closer than God, to Tom, red is like green and green is like red, that's got the same construction. To God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Okay, to Tom, red is like green and green is like red. What do you know about Tom? He's colour blind. So Tom is immune to colour. Okay, so if to God a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, God is immune to time. Right, that's the meaning of that. It has nothing to do with the days in Genesis at all. Because when you look at the original Psalm 90 verse 4, it's to thou, O Lord, a thousand years gone past is like a day in your sight. No one would ever apply that to Genesis. And then it goes on and says, teach us, O Lord, to number our days, because there are so few of them. Point, God doesn't have days. Illustration, he's no older today than he was yesterday. Right? So in other words, God is outside of time. So you can't use that argument to say, well, that adds another 6,000 years to Genesis because it simply doesn't. It has nothing to do with Genesis at all. It has to do with God and how he's outside of time. And he could call the plug tomorrow, but praise the Lord, he's merciful, but he will run out of mercy because he's going to be a God of justice as well as a God of mercy. Okay. One